welcome to Season 10, Episode 2 of the Ubuntu Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be reviewing the Entroware Ether laptop. We'll also have some command line love, and we'll go over your feedback. I'm Martin, and joining me this week are Mark. Hello, hello. Hello, and Alan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Are you saying that because it's just popped up that this segment has been started by Laura? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. So, what have you been up to, Mark? Uh, I've been doing a spot of gardening. Is this really? a new game on Steam? No, <laughs> no this is, this is uh, gardening IRL. Wow, in the big blue room. Yeah, um, I've been... <laughs> and uh, is this is this making good on the gardening or planting new stuff or... Yeah, this is sort of um, digging up old stuff and weeding a bit and planting some new chilli plants. Oh, oh chilies. Oh, right. Yes. Okay. Sort of my everything in my garden died over over the winter. So I mm-hmm. um, and I usually grow chilies in my little grow house. So uh, popped to the garden centre as I had a week off work and found some new chili plants. Um, so I'm I've got two varieties on the go, which will hopefully bear fruit. In so might the we summer. expect a small jar of uh, sweet chili a chili sauce at some point in the in the year? Uh, I've never tried that before. It depends how many I get. Really, <laughs> I, I usually just cook with them all and and make various things. So uh, uh, you might miss out on that. I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, you need to make friends to. with uh, Alan Lord, who grows tons and tons and tons of them, and then brings them along to pubs. And stupid people, after a couple of beers, try biting a tiny, tiny, tiny piece off of one of them, and then end up having Fine. to stop eating and <laughs> yeah glass, i, I grew some like that once <laughs> and now i i select the varieties which are the appropriate hotness for uh for my palate my mm. brother-in-law is also one of these mentalists that actually goes out and seeks and purchases the hottest chili that he can legally purchase and then sort of brutalizes himself with it He's, he's an odd bloke but it, it keeps him happy apparently i've just got this picture of him beating himself around the head with a chili pepper <laughs> I'll have to find out the names of these things. Yes. Martin, what have you been doing? Well, I've been spending Bitcoin. Oh. Um, yes, I've, I've got, I've got um, a, a little stash of Bitcoin. And at the moment, a single Bitcoin is worth approximately a thousand pounds. Wow. So that's a uh, lot of pounds. That's a lot of pounds. Yes. Yeah, so consequently, I, um, I have spent a fraction of a Bitcoin um, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I've, I've got, um, I think it was a couple of years ago. Anyway, I may have mentioned that I've got a 27 inch quad HD monitor that I've been using. Have you? No, I don't yes. think I remember you saying anything about that. Well, I now have two of those. <laughs> so so have, we'll hear about it twice as much. Yes. Yeah, so I'm now getting a suntan off these two <laughs> monitors that are in front of me um sort of slowly slowly um bleaching my skin um but it now means that i can uh, in the modern world i've now got a virtual workspace on my on my machine here which means i can have a telegram window and a hip chat window and an irc window and a google hangouts window and a slack oh. window and a gitter window and a rocket chat window it's like the good old days and of the 90s window. so i can have these eight chat clients you know just whirring away in front of me so i just need two keyboards to sort of complete the rick wakeman-esque you know command of my work station that i have now eight eight <laughs> eight chat clients that's the alarming thing here not yeah. the two like <laughs> quad hd monitors it's the fact yeah. that you've got eight chat clients over which is... which are actually required to communicate with people in the modern day in the open source community it's a little bit worrying hmm. anyway in happier news i've also spent a, another fraction of a bitcoin on a new audio interface a usb audio interface so i've got a focus right scarlet solo audio interface which has my xlr mic plugged into it oh that's quite cute it's yeah, quite small isn't it yes is yes, it usb powered it's usb powered and uh, it's really simple to operate so this was really um i'd got that mixer i think the same mixer that mark and you have got yeah. alan mm-hmm. yeah and i wasn't using any of the features so i've ebayed that and i've got this and uh it sounds really great and then i've also purchased some creative t30 wireless speakers which are wireless and wired so i notice in the features list for this set of speakers it says 2.0 wireless speakers it's like why do they need to say 2.0 I, there's there's two speakers i know this uh 
It says with NFC. What the hell yes. does a pair of speakers do with NFC? You get your NFC enabled phone, you bonk it on the main speaker and it Bluetooth pairs your phone with the speakers. Well, that's valuable, to, ma- yeah. valuable seconds of your life. You're never going to yeah, get back again. Isn't exactly. It? Okay. But um, actually, they're very good speakers and I've got them plugged into the audio interface and I've also got them Bluetooth paired to the Amazon Echo Dot. So uh, and then I've got other things connected to them via Bluetooth oh. as well. So it's I've got this super flexible speaker arrangement now in this room. I'm really happy. So I have music going all the time when I'm not listening to podcasts. It's great. Awesome. Excellent. Shall right. we get on with it then? Let's get on with Let's. it. So I hear that Mark got dibs on a new laptop from Entroware called the Entroware Ether. Is that right, Mark? That's right. That's mm. Ether spelt A-E-T-H-E-R for those who might be confused by the slightly odd spelling of Ether. Right. Or the correct spelling of Ether, which we usually spell wrong because it makes more sense. Anyway, so <laughs> it's he- a laptop. He- here's the here's the first. I'll give you the first question. Nice, easy one. If someone hadn't given it to you, would you buy this laptop? Um, I wouldn't, but I might recommend it to someone else. Why would you not? Because I would recommend it to someone if it was going to be their primary computing device, whereas like my my laptop is like a portable thing which I carry around and plug into things and so on. Whereas if I was going to if someone wanted a laptop which which was going to be more or less sort of stationary, but occasionally they wanted to move it somewhere else, I would probably recommend they have this. Okay. So this implies that maybe this is not the smallest of laptops. So how no. how big is it? What's the screen right. size? So specs so this isn't stuff? this isn't an ultrabook by any means. This um is uh it's a fifteen inch laptop. Uh it's got an optical drive, so that gives you an idea of how thick it is. Um is it, it from the past? <laughs> Says the man who buys 1980s ThinkPads <laughs> off of eBay. Um, Fair. Fair. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. With um, floppy so, drives. Yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's, it's, it's thick. It's sort of a matte plastic affair. It is more of the sort of thing which would appeal to a ThinkPad fan than a MacBook fan, definitely. Um, the, the one I got, it had a 15-inch 1080p screen, uh, which was very nice, I have to say. Um, it has a full size keyboard with a number pad as well, which is nice. I like number pads. Mm-hmm. Is, um, the, is the is the touchpad beneath the space bar or is it or to the right? Uh, yes, it's beneath the space bar, right, which okay. I did find when I was playing a few games on it. That was a bit funny. Mm. Um, if I was going to be playing a game on it for any length of time, I would plug a mouse in or a Steam controller, certainly. Okay. Um my general first impressions it's quite sleek it's quite nice looking um it's sort of i mean yeah the 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 touchpad is kind of plastic and frictiony a bit more so because i'm used to using uh, a metal touchpad which is a lot smoother but um i'm sure it would wear flat in time <laughs> uh one thing so uh when i was reviewing this i asked on our telegram channel which you can uh, join at ubuntupodcast.org slash telegram um i asked people what they wanted to know about a laptop if they were listening to a review so i've tried to answer all of the questions uh which i might get through in 15 minutes we'll Wait see but one of the, the things someone asked was how many touches does the uh does the touchpad detect uh, as far as i could tell it only detects two so you can do a two finger click to do a right click. Oh, sorry, a two finger tap to do a right click. Mm-hmm. If you enable tap to click, which wasn't on by default, um, but a three finger click just registers as a two finger click. Right. I don't know if that's the software configurable or a hardware mm. limitation. That or could not. that could be software. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, but yeah. So uh, in general, um, it came uh, that the spec that I had. Um, there's various options available. Mine was uh, sort of middle to low range of the available options so i had an i5 processor 128 gig ssd um it had uh, as i said the 1080p screen which is an optional extra so uh, the base spec is 
1360 by 768. Um, and it comes with uh, Intel HD 620 graphics built into the chip, which can do up to 4K over HDMI and supports OpenGL 4.4. What about is the battery removable? The battery, ah, right. The battery is removable. Um, so it's external. In fact, it just clips on the outside like an old school laptop. Um, I did uh, do a sort of mini teardown just to see how uh, user serviceable the whole thing was, uh, because that's quite important to me. As listeners will know, how often I have to repair my laptop. Uh, so um, after I took off the battery, I then uh, there were thirteen tiny phillips head screws on the bottom of the case they all undid easily uh i then had to use a plastic opening tool which i had to unclip the sort of metal clip uh, sorry plastic clips in the case just to pop off the bottom uh once that was off i could get at basically everything so i could see the uh there's an m sata ssd which it came with there's a, an additional sata bay um you can get well, the well, RAM sorry slots. rewind it, there's an m sata slot yeah, and you said there's another soft slot. Is uh, that yeah, an a normal, M- or um, a, just a normal laptop size hard drive SATA okay. slot. And what did it have in it? It just the one I had just had an M SATA. Oh, interesting. SSD. You can get it. The base, the very base, sort of cheapest option, just has an HDD right. in the spinning rust. Yeah, right. Yeah. But you can upgrade it as far as a four terabyte SSD if you want. Any other interesting things inside? Um. Nothing unusual, but you can get at everything, and okay. uh, all of the internal screws are the same sort as the external screws, just little Phillips head ones. So you could quite easily, from what I could tell, tear down the whole thing if you wanted. Right. So if you needed to like blow the fans and all that kind of stuff, and, or replace yeah, the yeah. SSD, or replace whatever, the motherboard, or whatever. Yes, and, and you this can do is that. something that you're acutely aware of now. You've had to <laughs> yes. disassemble and reassemble exactly. your laptop several times. <laughs> yeah. What, um, okay. Are you done on the inside? Uh, yeah. So. What about um, from the software side? What did it ship with? So it shipped with Ubuntu 16.04 LTS. And was um, it set up to do all the old uh, OEM config things? So yes. you just had to do the exactly. name and So I turned it on, stuff. typed all that in, um, and then it did the setup and took me to a desktop. The slightly odd thing um, is at that point, the wireless didn't work. So having okay. put in the, the password during the setup, so it connected That's during setup. In Ubuntu. Yeah, I then rebooted and it worked. Okay. Um, uh, I looked at uh, I looked at the drivers to see what was installed, and it had the uh, the Intel processor microcode installed, but nothing else proprietary would came up as being required. Did you did you once you've like set it all up? Did you use it on a regular basis? Did you just like you know poke at it and shut the lid, or did you actually? No, I I use did. It? I I used it for an afternoon. Uh, to make the OddCamp website, in fact. And then I used right. it just for a couple of evenings just as my as my laptop and also to see if I would use it instead of my laptop. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I had a good play with it. Did you get any idea of battery life? Uh, okay, so battery life, the, the sort of stress test I did of it was when I was actually working on it. So I made I didn't make any effort to save battery. I had it plugged into an, uh, plugged into an external screen over HDMI, um, I didn't mess around, turn off the wireless or adjust the screen brightness or anything. Um, and under that being used constantly, it lasted about three hours um, right. and took about three hours to recharge. So nothing to write home about, really. But again, for what I would recommend it for, that's kind of OK, I think. Do you know what sort of price point the laptop of the spec that you were given retails yes. for? Yes. So the one... Exactly what I was given uh, would cost uh, six hundred and seventy pounds, including that and delivery. Um, I believe so. Yes. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, six hundred yeah. and sixty-four pounds and ninety-five p. Including. <laughs> it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, what's your like overall impression of you know you you've said you wouldn't necessarily buy this yourself because you like thin light laptops that you car around all over the place yeah. and this feels too bulky but for someone yes. who has like a computer desk at home exactly where it's mostly plugged in all the time and they maybe pick it up and move to the sofa sometimes yeah. it would be yeah. ideal yes and for that i think for the spec and the price point i think it was about right for that did you install steam i did of course 
<laughs> yes, uh, and I question. had a go at playing some games. Um, so um, I tried a variety of games at a variety of uh, complexities in terms of graphics to see what it would do. So um, I tried uh, Streets of Rogue, which is a, a 2D um, a 2D game, so nothing in the way of 3D acceleration needed there, and that was absolutely fine. Um, I tried the Stanley Parable, which is a 3D game, yeah. but it's quite a simple game, uh, and that was fine. I then tried uh, the Talos Principle, which is a far more complex 3D game, um, and that was... Uh, at, so. In each of these, I just took the default settings that it gave me. So in that case, it gave me the default settings at 1080p, and it was completely unplayable. It was giving me about 12 frames per second. Wow. Um, so Is that then with, I, with detail dialed up, did you have to then not this was, dial it This was what it, what it gave me. Right. So I think it was sort of um, whatever it auto-detected that it should have been capable of, basically. Um, I didn't adjust anything up or down. Um, the thing with, with um, Talos is that... You don't tell it what detail level to give you. It looks at how powerful your processor is, yeah, and like your it GPU. To, in, yeah, so, so it, it gives you, you a hardware scale rather than a um, rather than a software scale. But I then tried adjusting the settings to um, to seven twenty and to low power hardware, and it was just barely playable, um, but still not good. So what not a gaming say? laptop then. Well, what I then did was I installed the Xorg Edges PPA and installed the latest Mesa drivers, and it then became playable on the default settings um, at about 40 frames a second. Oh, wow. Wow. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so it's not a hardcore gaming laptop. If, if you're trying to buy a gaming laptop, don't buy this. But if you want something which will do you for casual gaming, it we'll will, do a job. but not out of the box. So when you, when you were playing these games, I imagine that puts the CPU under a bit more um low did the fans kick up and yes did they make much noise so when when it was completely idle you couldn't hear it at all um it was noticeable under moderate load um right. so you know um if you're if you've got game music playing then you're concentrating on the game music you tone out the fans it's not that bad but if you're if you've not got any other noise on you'll you'll know it's there when it's sitting on your lap or right in front of you um in terms of sort of temperature wise, uh, it were, it idles around uh, fifty degrees, but goes up to sort of seventies when it's under uh, under big load, like when I'm, when you're playing a complex game. Okay. And when you were playing these games, were you using the internal speakers? Yes. And I don't know why I'm asking this question because they're <laughs> always rubbish. But how how were the internal speakers <laughs> rubbish? Right. <laughs> yeah surprise exactly surprise. what you'd expect from a laptop from a laptop yes exactly so. yes um yeah. and what did about, you go on I, the one thing I'd, uh i haven't i don't recall us mentioning was ports like what's yeah. the what, what sort of ports has it got oh okay so that's interesting so it's got um a headphone microphone combined port no sorry separate head, headphone microphone ports oh you mean a courage port yes <laughs> So uh, a, gr- a green got, and a pink port. It's got yes. one of those what, what flip, ports has flip it got? down Ethernet ports that Alan hates. Oh, yep. Yeah. It's got an HDMI Have port. Have broken that yet? No. Okay. It was actually quite robust. I played with it quite a bit. It's got two <laughs> USB 2 ports. Like flipping it up and down to see yeah. if you can break it. <laughs> this is the two-hour <laughs> open close. Open close. Yeah. It's got two USB 2 ports. It's got a USB 3 port. It's got a USB C port. It's got oh. an SD slot. And it's got a VGA port. Oh, mm. Hmm. interesting. So quite well equipped on the ports front then. Yeah. yeah and you said good. it was fitted with an optical drive. What I, I take it that it was a DVD. Yes. Is it a um, DVD burner or just I a... think, yes, it's a, I think it's a DVD RAM drive. So it will take any kind of DVD disc okay. you've got, basically. And did you attempt playing a film on the DVD drive? I did that. That was one of the things that I was asked to do. Wow. Um, okay. So... This is so. This is out of the box. Set up Ubuntu. Picked a random DVD out of my DVD shelf. Stuck it in. So it propped up a prompt asking what program I should use. I selected videos. Videos opened and searched for codecs. It then offered to install either GStreamer Ugly or GStreamer Bad, which both had nice red warning icons next to them. <laughs> so I left it with the with the default selection, which was Ugly. Packages installed, 
Nothing happened. Okay, so I, I tried again. Um, I got the same prompt. So I selected both um, and they installed and nothing happened. Hmm. And so I tried again and I got a pop up saying uh, the film could not be read. Yeah. And at that point, I stopped. So, so not a great experience for a new user if you're trying to play a DVD. Yeah. 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 Oh, boy. Yeah, okay. So for anyone listening to Ubuntu Podcast for the first time and wondering how you play a DVD on <laughs> on Ubuntu, you need a library called LibDVD CSS, which isn't in the archives, but there it is, is a script. Or there's, there's an, yeah. a really easy way to install it from a package in the archives now. There is. You apt install Ubuntu Mate Welcome and click on the I want to enable DVD playback button. No, there's, there's actually a package in the archive. Yeah, which this... you install and it sorts it out for you. Oh, is there? Yes. Because there used to be a package that had a shell script inside it. Yeah. You, it doesn't you what, have a shell script that you have to run separately anymore. It just sort of does it. After we finish recording, can we find that package and include it in the show notes? We because, will. Yeah. Yes. We don't know the name of that package, but that sounds like something useful. Yes. Awesome. So, um, yeah. I mean, in conclusion, if you like kind of ThinkPad-like laptops and you want something which uh which has ubuntu pre-installed then i would definitely take a look at this awesome thanks mark are you going to send it back or are you keeping it <laughs> it's already gone unfortunately oh, oh and thanks <laughs> no, to oh, yes. for you big thanks to entroware yeah thanks to entroware for supplying that review unit and if we're lucky we might get another one later in the season oh if you love the command line as much as we do, send us a command that will blow our minds, and we might even mention it on the show. Send your command line love to show at ubuntupodcast.org. Oh, is it me? <laughs> is this, is this going to be a theme of this year's podcast? Sorry. Um, Mark's, Mark's <laughs> surprised voice. Do we need to have like a sting that we insert every so often? Mark going, oh. <laughs> Ah, now it's time for Command Line Love. And this week's Command Line Love is Watch NVIDIA SMI. So That's two commands. Well, no, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's one command line. Okay, uh, I'll let you have that. Um so NVIDIA SMI is a utility that comes with the NVIDIA drivers, if you have an NVIDIA graphics chip. Uh, which will show you a nice table of information about what's going on at the moment, which has things like the fan speed and the temperature of the GPU, the voltage it's drawing, the amount of memory it's got, and which processes are using how much memory. Um, and if you combine this with watch, then you can basically monitor what's going on um, while you're running the command. So the reason that I came across this was I wanted to know how much the games I was playing on my Steam box were taxing my oh, new graphics right. card. I did wonder, because I thought you were like all AMD all the time, never NVIDIA ever, ever. No, I was uh, AMD because was it, was, it was convenient and cheap and uh, right. power friendly when I was building my Steam box. Gotcha. Um, but now you have a Now I have GPU. an NVIDIA discrete graphics card. Right. Uh, and and I was playing I was playing some games and I thought well I wonder you know I can tell that they can that my graphics card can handle this but I wonder you know what's the margin between what it's doing now and what it's able to do so what I found by running this I could see um, you know how how much the fans were running so how much noise I would expect to hear if they were really taxed um, and how much more so if I was playing a game on high settings. How much memory was it using? Could it perhaps handle mm. ultra settings if I went for them instead? That's nice. Yeah. And so you do this via SSH from exactly. your laptop, I guess. Exactly. Right. So I have my laptop sitting next to me while I'm playing with SSH running and this command running, and I play the game, and I just sort of keep an eye on what it's doing. You know what you should do? You should wire up your O2 joggler that's next to the tail. <laughs> <laughs> have that as your oh. GPU monitor. Yeah. Yeah, one of my friends does have a, a nice LCD display on the front of his gaming PC, which oh, nice. does this sort of thing. But yeah, I found out some really interesting things. For for example, if you're running Steam in big picture mode, it constantly uses uh, half a gig of graphics memory, even if it's just running in the background. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Sounds That's like a very useful profiling tool. Because there. you can't... I, I use Steam with Steam Link, and you can't use a Steam Link without using big picture mode 
So right. yes. that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, oh. fortunately, because I my, my new graphics card has loads and loads of uh, RAM on it, uh, it's not an issue for me and I can still like fill it up with actual games but it was just interesting to see yeah what else was going on and like if i've got uh because the way i run it i have cody running in the background and then i switch to a steam session right um and cody's running in the background but cody doesn't really use very much so it doesn't matter and you've got like xorg there which takes a few megabytes as well um but yeah it's interesting to see how much steam uses when all it's doing is giving you an interface to launch the game mm. Mm. awesome thanks for that Brilliant. all right did you know you can come and chat with us and other listeners in between shows? Come and join us in our Telegram group at ubuntupodcast.org slash telegram. And now it's time for your feedback. Amazingly, we have some so early in the season. So, first up, uh, Caleb Stefan emailed us at show at ubuntupodcast.org. I am just curious if you and or your family have no problems with giving up privacy using such things as Amazon Echo. Do you think it's just no issue or there are much more relevant pros for you than cons? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, this is someone, why I don't have one. Uh, what? I because do. because people will email you questions questioning <laughs> your, your life choices. Is that no, why? <laughs> because I don't. I, I, I do think it's a problem to have a device that's always listening that I don't necessarily know what it's doing. So you already have that in your pocket. Do I? Yeah. You've got a phone. Right. And you have no way of knowing what that's doing because it's proprietary firmware. All right. <laughs> so, so like, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, why don't, why don't I just throw a bunch more devices around about the house and have them always listening? Like, you know, screw it. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's a rather flippant answer, but, um yeah i am you know a little concerned but not that concerned yep i'm a little concerned not that concerned and i would say that the pros are outweighing the cons at the moment it's definitely a very useful device for well a whole raft of things um but it's a bit like different but a bit like a raspberry pi if you've got a Raspberry Pi because you like to make stuff and tinker with electronics and fiddle around with things, the Amazon Echo is a bit like that in that it's another thing that you can hack with and create new solutions with. And I like it for that point of view. Mm. And I'm a prag pragmatic person. I'm not a Richard Stallman. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Alistair Grant emailed us. For me, one of the strengths of Arch Linux is the AUR. I've actually had occasion where software worked better under Arch than Ubuntu. I don't believe it. From an <laughs> AUR build that downloaded and unpacked a DEB for a printer driver. Given that snaps are also reasonably easy to create, I was wondering what you thought of the idea of creating an AUR-like repository for user-created snaps. Isn't that what the Snap Store is? Yes. Yeah. Good. Well, yes and no, uh, because the it, it, the general encouragement is that uh, users, like in the AUR, as I understand it, anyone can package anything, basically. Right. Um, uh, that figure is true. Right. Whereas with Snaps, what they're trying to do is encourage the owner of the software product to package the product. So rather than Joe Smith going off and saying, you know what would be good is if Firefox was in the Snappy store, them packaging it and then putting it in the store and calling it Firefox would be a problem because then users might install that thinking that it was packaged by Firefox or Mozilla themselves. I'm just using that as an example. Um, but So would they have to call the package Snow Mongoose or something? No, they could call it Firefox, but they might call it Firefox dash Joe Smith. So you know that it was not a like pucker upstream it may well be perfectly valid and reproducible build and done by joe well-meaning well-intentioned but i think the goal is really to have the snap store a uh, you know semi not curated but um you know responsibly filled now that doesn't mean you can't do it <laughs> because you can you can package other people's stuff but when they come along and say hey that's my stuff 
and I'd like to be responsible for that. We should really hand it over to them so that when the upstream developer releases a new version, it's very quickly pushed to the store so that users get the latest version of stuff rather than having to wait on or being blocked on some random guy in the community who may or may not be around, may have wandered off, maybe on holiday, or may not know what the release cycle for that product is. So there are plenty of good reasons why that's in place. That said, yeah, you could create a site which hosted snaps and people could download those snaps and install them, or you could create some kind of store. That's entirely plausible and it would be somewhat like the AUR. And, and to just build on what you were saying, what I've started to notice is that people that are publishing snaps of software that they're not the upstream for, I've started to notice that they're now using dash unofficial on the package name. So in in your example, Firefox dash unofficial mm. and are now reaching out to the upstreams and saying, I have made a snap. Um, would you like me to be the official maintainer in order to get the snap craft upstreamed so that they can then maintain it as part of the overall project cool and finally in the feedback david apps emailed i was surprised to read on the following page that the nationwide building society seem not to support any web browser running on linux i've been using their internet banking service with mozilla firefox and ubuntu mate oops i've said it for a while <laughs> and while their website does have does have many accessibility features these are still present when i try it with mozilla firefox on microsoft windows mm. Mm. one one thing i would point out is there's a difference between works with and supported true Su- supported means if you complain at them that it doesn't work then they'll try and fix it but it doesn't mean that if it's not supported it won't work mm. so i guess that basically they don't have anyone there with any knowledge or interest to to get it well make sure it's working on linux but that doesn't mean it won't right and how nice to see a mention of the distro that shall not be named in episode one brilliant (laughs) is that the end of the feedback yeah And that's all for episode two of ubuntupodcast.org slash telegram. We'll be back next week when we'll have more news, comment and discussion. Excellent. We made it. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I think uh, we can take our training wheels off for episodes three and four, can't we? That was a little bit, little bit wonky, but I think, I think we got away with it. I don't think they'll notice. No, I think (laughs) see you next week. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. And stop. Stop recording. <laughs> Good old. That was Mycroft. Yay!